have three speakers today. Our first speaker is Claude Comp. Claude is, going, is, an, is a particularly big energy expert at TSC and has worked a lot on electricity, among other subjects. Claude is going to talk to us today about hydrogen. Claude, uh, I think you're with us today. Do you have your microphone on? I hope so. Is Hello. it? Thank you for being here, Claude. Okay. So, Hello, everybody. Hi. I'm going to leave you five minutes, Claude, to talk to us about hydrogen. Um, just a quick introduction, perhaps. Across Europe, governments are hedging billions of euros on a bet that hydrogen will gradually become a clean, safe and affordable energy carrier. But you believe this may be wishful thinking unless there is a significant decline in production and distribution costs. Can you tell us more about this? Well, a little bit more, yes. Uh, so we, we start with uh, some kind of momentum in favor of hydrogen and uh, it ended out uh, in a kind of frenzy more recently. Uh, it is true that over the past summer, uh, France, Germany, uh, the European Commission and others have pledged to spend billions of euros to invest in hydrogen technologies. Um, these public commitments are motivated by the objective to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And uh, hydrogen is viewed as a critical part of this uh, decarbonation process. Uh, all these plants, national or not, uh, have some common features. They aim at building uh, a global leadership in the hydrogen domain, bringing together renewable and low carbon hydrogen production, uh, demand in industry, mobility and other sectors, and hydrogen transmission and distribution. And of course, they also provide the creation of many, many jobs, as usual. On the supply side, the objective is the greening of hydrogen production. It means uh, switching to water catalysis fed by power from renewables instead of the current technology based on fossil fuels. It is an important uh, prerequisite since hydrogen is an essential input in some industries, for example, for oil refining, and the production of fertilizers. But uh, greening will not be easy. Uh, a study released in June by the German Institute for International and Security Affairs notes that green hydrogen is almost four times more expensive to produce than conventional gray hydrogen, which is broadly used uh, across Germany's industrial sector. Then it will take a, a considerable drop in the cost of electrolysis to make hydrogen environmentally friendly at the production stage. On the demand side, the objective is even more ambitious. It consists in enlarging the use of hydrogen, of green hydrogen, to energy storage and the fueling of all kinds of transport. Indeed, the, the big advantage of hydrogen is that it is climate friendly as it does not emit any carbon dioxide when used that is at the consumption locations. But despite this quality, green hydrogen is not a panacea. Uh, let me focus on two reasons. First, it must be recalled that hydrogen is an energy carrier. It is not an energy producer. It can replace the fossil fuel burned by cars, trucks, buses, uh, ships, even planes when equipped with uh, fuel cells. It can replace uh, natural gas in industry and uh, in district heating. It can replace uh, electrical batteries, but uh, a, storage, a storage facility cannot replace electrical plants. Green hydrogen must be extracted from methane or water, which requires energy. Then it is not a substitute to power plants, it is a complement. It transports, it can transport energy in time like a wise transmit uh, energy in space. As for hydrogen transportation and its use for fueling vehicles, uh, hydrogen is light, but bulky. The, the energy density of uh, hydrogen is very high when measured in megajoules per kilogram, but it is very low in megajoules per liter. Uh, this makes it equal to store on board any vehicle. It must be either pressurized to 200 or 700 bar or uh, liquefied at minus 250 uh, degrees Celsius in an insulating and bulky container. And this necessitates uh, even more and more energy. 
On top of that, there is no established infrastructure for making and distributing it. So to conclude this very brief presentation, I say that uh, considering past experiences and the current state of the art, uh, we have a long road ahead before meeting the great expectations uh, which politicians have placed in green hydrogen. It will take uh, uh, much more than uh, marginal technical improvements. And it will also necessitate clear advances in the regulation of the energy industries to integrate the storage technologies. And I stop here. Thank you very much, Claude. Um, congratulations, you respected your five minutes. I'm very impressed. Um, we will just to remind everybody, we're going to let the three speakers go through their points first of all, and then we're going to go through all the questions and answers. So over to you, uh, Christian. So Christian uh, Gaulier, um, you have flown the flag for a universal carbon price as a strong policy solution to climate change for quite a long time now. Do you still hold this position? Are you confident that policymakers are actually going to take action? Can you talk to us a bit, a bit about that, please? Yes, more than ever, I'm convinced that it's at least in this current condition to attain the uh, climate ambition uh, that we collectively decided to, uh, to, to generate. So, so first point, I mean, we, need, we, we all need to realize that we are responsible ourselves, you and me, uh, of the climate damages today and for the next three centuries at least. Uh, so to just uh, try to give you an idea of what that means, each ton of CO2 that you and I, we emit, uh, will generate a damage that we can estimate around 1,200 euros, uh, which take place on average in 80 years from now. Uh, so, and if you take into account that each European emits on average seven ton of CO2 every year, you do the math by yourself, we are, each of us, uh, creating a big uh, climate debt, and we are responsible uh, to our future generation about that. So there is a simple solution to this uh, externality problem uh, that the economists have been uh, submitting for a long time to the policymakers uh, and, and with lawyers and, and social scientists. We all agree that we need uh, to apply the polluter pay, pay principle. That is, you pollute, you pay for that. Uh, that's uh, that's not punitive, it's just incentive. So you align the private interest with the common good by forcing people to pay for the damage that they generate. So that carbon pricing, you can put it in place through a carbon tax or uh, by a market uh, for permits. And keep in mind, I mean, prices affect our life. The when you change prices, people react to that. And I have no time to present an example of that. But there are millions of examples of why and how prices radica can radically transform our behavior. Uh, so we have an objective to get to net zero emissions in 2050. Uh, look at the myriad of actions that the myriad of people will have to perform in order to attain this objective. We need to attain this objective at the least cost. And the best way to do that is to impose a carbon price that is uniform, universal, everybody should pay the same price because each molecule of CO2 emitted in the atmosphere generates the same, the same damages. Um, but, but the carbon price could also be interpreted as a, a shadow price associated to these climate constraints. And that's the minimum, that's the price we need to impose to the whole uh, agent in the economy to guarantee that those efforts will be performed with sufficient intensity to get to the zero net emission by the year 2050. So uh, there is a wide variety of uh, possibilities, a wide variety of costs that sort of CO2 save. Claude was just presenting the idea of hydrogen to be transformed into methane. The actual uh, cost per ton of CO2 saved of the technology is currently estimated at least in France around uh, 770 euros per ton of CO2 saved. So to just give you the idea of the, the, the variety of cost compared to, for example, replacing coal by natural gas in Poland, it costs only 30 euros per ton of CO2 saved. So let me finish with uh, a few a few words about what's the solution. Of course, 
and carbon pricing is a theoretical idea, but it's also easy to put in practice. We, in France, we have a carbon tax. We also have in Europe a, a, a market for permits, uh, the EU ETS, and it works relatively well. It already covers 45% of all EU emissions. What we propose, what I propose, is to expand this EU ETS in such a way that it covers all emissions uh, in, on, the, uh, on the European soil, including housing, transportation, shipping, airline industry, everything. No exemption. Everybody should pay the same price in Europe. And also, we should support importance of goods and services that are uh, high carbon items uh, to pay also for the emissions they generated by offering those products to our European consumers. We should also impose, the, on top of that, the name of that is carbon border adjustment uh, that is currently discussed under the EU Green Deal project. We should also impose a corridor for carbon prices uh, that should grow at around, at around 5% per year in order to give credibility and insurance for uh, the entrepreneur who will uh, be crucial for the uh, triggering of this energy transition. And finally, we should redistribute the carbon dividend generated by the selling or the auctioning of the of the uh, of these uh, permits on the uh, on the uh, EU market. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. We'll come back to this in the question and answer session. Uh, Jean Tirole uh, is with us today. Uh, Jean Tirole. Um, whilst joining, I think, Christian, in, on, on the aspect of the car carbon pricing, more generally, you advocate an international climate coalition based on three criteria, economic efficiency, incentives to respect commitments, and fairness. Can you tell us more? And are you optimistic about this kind of international climate, despite, for example, the, the cancelling of the COP26? Jean, we just need you to put your microphone on, on, on. you are allowed. Thank Apologies. you. Thank, thank you, Jenny, for this very simple question. Uh, I will have a five point of view of the international dimension. Uh, point number one, you are going to tell me is not really about international matters. Uh, we have to stop coal. Coal is a very low hanging fruit. Remember, it's 30 to 40 euros uh, per ton removed. Uh, but for that, of course, we have to compensate losers. In Europe, it's Poland and Germany. The Just Transition Fund is going to do that. That's a good thing. It's more complicated worldwide because 80% uh, of the coal production today is in Asia. So compensating is not that easy. Point number two, uh, what can the EU do? Um, you have to realize that EU28 is a very small, small piece of the climate change puzzle. 9% um, of global emissions. France actually is less than 1%. And nonetheless, I believe that Europe has its part to play. Uh, first, by leading by example, the demonstration effect, showing that things can be done, the shaming effect. Second, as Christian said, by having a border tax adjustment, which is going to level the playing field between domestic firms and firms located in countries with lax enforcement of uh, climate regulations and put pressures on those countries to join a climate club. Of course, we would like this to be as rule-based as possible, maybe with the WTO involved if possible. Third, Europe can engage in green R&D, I will come back to that, and give the technologies to the poor countries. And finally, uh, Europe can play a leadership role in um, designing efficient and credible uh, international agreements. Point number three, boosting innovation. As you all know, innovations come primarily from the private sector, but that doesn't mean the public sector has no role to play. Actually, I am in favor of creating an ARPA-E agency. Um, we have too little R&D. Uh, as you know, 4% of the world R&D, public and private, is actually uh, dedicated to climate change, which is chicken feed given the stakes. Now, an APA R&D in Europe will, refund, will fund high-risk, high-reward research. But of course, you have to avoid wasting the funds. And you need an agency which is independent, 
as a true high-level measures with substantial operational uh, flexibility to set goals. So for example, in terms of battery capacity and longevity, rather than, rather than a way of achieving those goals. It will grant resources using a peer reviewed process. It will not spread funds. It will include a sunset close and, and withdraw the money when things don't work. What about the ECB, point number four? Uh, the ECB has to run climate stress test, uh, which is already within the mandate of central banks. Um, I'm much more reluctant to have the ECB relax prudential standards on banks for their green lending, uh, both for legitimacy reasons, that can be fixed, of course, but also because I don't think green finance should be the new subprime. And the issue with financing of green innovation has nothing to do with the shortage of loanable funds, actually there are many, but rather with the a lack of associated in, uh, income prospects. Same thing with ECB financing uh, the energy transition itself. This will be debt financing, and it's up to the states themselves to engage in debt financing in full transparency and without putting the credibility of the ECB at risk. Finally, the ECB can divest, uh, eliminate carbon intensive assets for its, from its portfolio. I'm in favor of a strong expressive content, but you have to realize that there's only so much we can expect from that because of course there are other buyers, there is a leakage, which is obvious. And point number four to conclude is a diplomatic channel. Actually, I don't have that much to say about that, but I just want to say that the United Nations is, is a fine process, but when you give veto power to 196 nations, what you end up is, with is a least common denominator uh, outcome, just like COP21 has shown. So many people have said we should have a climate club, which will include a number of large emitters agreeing on a core, on a set of core action, then putting diplomatic pressure on other countries to join. Of course, the election of Joe Biden is a good news with respect to that, but you know, there are still a lot of hurdles to, to meet. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thanks very much, all three of you. Okay, um, so we're running even ahead of schedule. Thank you for being very brief. I know we could listen to you for a lot longer. Let's um, keep listening to you through answers to the many, many, many questions we're receiving. Um, let's start, I think, let's go back uh, to Claude. Good comp to have a little, come back a little bit to the questions of hydrogen. Um, we, uh, we have people who share your concerns about hydrogen and wonder whether there will be any applications for which it actually does make sense. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. It's true that uh, my presentation has been quite critical. Uh, so the, one of the questions we face here is that uh, there is an important geographical dimension of the hydrogen deployment. And... Um, where to invest will be the source of political uh, bickering between countries, regions, large cities, and so on. And uh, then it is feared that uh, efficiency will not be the main driver for investments. Uh, actually, instead of scattering the resources, investment should be concentrated at spots with uh, high capacities and demand. And I think I think it's not my own idea. I read that in a report by International Energy Agency. I think it's a good idea. Uh, at the beginning, uh, funds should be concentrated at seaports, at large seaports. Uh, why that? Uh, first, because seaports have uh, already an expertise and uh, the equipment to process liquef liquefied and pressurized gases. And so the, we import and export of uh, Natural, uh, liquefied natural gas, they know how to process that. There is a second reason, uh, is that uh, these ports uh, are close to some offshore wind farms. So they can have access to uh, green energy. And uh, because they are not too far away from uh, these uh, wind farms, uh, the, the thermal losses online will be low. Uh, a third reason uh, refers to the the curse of volume and heavy I was uh, uh, 
discussing formally because uh, they, they could fuel large capacity vessels because any boat, uh, any floating engine uh, is less subject to this curse than uh, that penalizes the terrestrial vehicles. And there is a, uh, maybe a fourth reason is that uh, these uh, seaports uh, in general are well connected to highways and railways. So they, they are like hubs with spokes used by uh, heavy duty trucks and trains. And these could be uh, fueled by hydrogen. So maybe here there is a, an interesting uh, starting point for technical application. Yes, um, we have a sort of an, an extension of the question that could hydrogen be used as a carrier in extracting oil from oil sands, for example, in Canada? Ah, well, that's uh, much more technical, so I prefer to, to not to answer this question. Coming on to maybe a question still for you, Claude, but coming, uh, coming on to could the notion of carbon pricing. So Christian and Jean, at any point, if you'd like to um, reply, even if, uh, if the question is for a colleague, then please do. Given that such carbon pricing is put in place, would that put the people of lower income who already have limited access to resources overall in a much more disadvantaged position? And if yet, how should we deal with this inequality? Christian, you might like to, to step in also on this. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important question. I mean, it's clear that uh, we need to have everybody on board, uh, not only the Western world, but also the South. Uh, and uh, it's also true that uh, the North uh, bear a special responsibility in the mess created by climate change. Uh, also, I mean, when you look at uh, the, the, the emissions per capita, uh, it's completely clear that, you know, <laughs> Uh, people from the living in the US emit so much more than people in Congo, for example, uh, something like 100 and 1,000 1, more. Uh, so uh, there is one, one argument, one ethical argument that would suggest that if we would like to organize uh, a mechanism where uh, uh, we, would, we would allocate permits uh, in the world in order to reduce emission, to be sure that we do not emit more than what we can, if we want to fulfill the two degree Celsius target, uh, there would be a solution where everybody should get the same number of permits, the same emit, emission permit per capita. And in that case, uh, of course, people from Congo will, will, will get something like, I don't know, five tons of CO2 permit. They could sell most of it because they don't, don't need it now uh, to, the, uh, to the American citizens. Uh, and that would generate a large benefit for those uh, developing countries, but of course, that's 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 an ethical proposal. Of course, that will not be possible because in the US they, they will not accept that. But there is an idea that by using a uh, market for permits, we can redistribute implicitly wealth across nation by offering free permits to uh, to the to the citizens of the world on uh, something related to a per capita basis. And do you think that the the EU is prepared, for example, if we think about Europe, we have people from all around the world today, so there may be obviously a different perspective from different areas. Is the EU prepared for the adjustments to the broader tax system implied by switching away from taxing fossil fuels to raising tax through carbon pricing? Do you think the EU is and or should be preparing for this? So, uh, for, for, uh, in terms of taxation, we know that Europe needs... Uh, 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 unanimity for that kind of decision. That's why uh, 20 years ago, uh, Europe opted for uh, uh, a market for permits rather than a, on the carbon tax. Uh, and it's still the, the problem today. I mean, uh, we, and we see, of course, the resistance everywhere. France, that emits relatively less uh, CO2 than many other members of the uh, Union, uh, has an advantage of prom promoting a, a pricing solution because the first to be hit by a larger price of CO2 uh, permit on the, uh, in the Union will be Poland, for example, which uh, currently uh, 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 produces electricity by using 80% uh, based, based on, on coal. And we know that if you increase the price of uh, the permit by above something like 30, 35 euros per ton of CO2, which is currently the, uh, the region of the price on the market, uh, there will be a, a 
coal will not be competitive anymore, and that will be, and it will be replaced by natural gas. Natural gas is not a long-term solution, but at least in the, in the short run, natural gas emit much less CO2 per, uh, per kilowatt hour than coal. So that's a solution. But, but the point is, uh, Poland will lose uh, by doing that, and that's why Poland, and we have seen that in the recent weeks, uh, resist uh, any solution based on the carbon pricing solution. But that, that's, that's a free hiding problem. And we, we know, I mean, if we would have a world government, uh, we could implement an easy solution with carbon pricing. The fact that we have, uh, as said by, by Jean, I mean, we have almost 200 countries, that means 200 vetoes and two, 200 free riders. Uh, and, that's, and there is no simple solution as long as we cannot send tanks uh, and, and, uh, and, and our soldiers to, uh, to impose a, a, a fair and efficient uh, climate, uh, climate solution to the world. Yes, thanks. I, I, two, two points in your, in your reply, Christian, that bring me on to other questions. We can perhaps come back to Jean afterwards with the notion of, of this coalition and how to avoid free riding. But just for a moment to come back to Claude, you, you mentioned, Christian, in your reply, different, you mentioned coal. And obviously we have all these different sources of, of energy and, and it's not easy to work out what is the best mix of energy. Um, Claude, uh, some countries are still using coal to produce electricity. Can they really, and how can they switch quickly to low carbon, for example, in Asia? Well, uh, I have no idea of what engineers will propose for the end of the century, that uh, for the next decades, uh, given the decarbonation priority, uh, of course, natural gas is better than, than coal, but uh, it's not a solution either. Uh, I think that investing in nuclear energy is the best way to replace coal and natural gas in power production. Uh, so as I remember, there are currently more than uh, 400 uh, or maybe 450 nuclear units operating in uh, probably 30 countries, and some 50 units are actually under construction. And uh, as for Asia, uh, there are many construction sites uh, in India and in China. Uh, so I'm not sure it will suffice to replace coal, and coal will have, uh, unfortunately, for some time, uh, uh, a very important role in these countries. But uh, for the next decades, uh, the investment in uh, nuclear energy probably will go on. Yeah. Um, talking in that case, perhaps about, about uh, Asia, India, different countries. Um, Jean, maybe we can come back to this notion of the climate coalition. Do you think that China and India and most of all Asia will join the climate change coalition? If they don't, could it be a big risk for the other developed economies, for Europe, elsewhere? Well, China is a big question mark, of course, because they have become much more climate conscious and they invest a lot in green energy. At the same time, they are also 52% uh, of the coal production in the world, which is huge. So uh, the question, and you know, I'm not in, uh, a diplomat, so I don't know much about the, the changes of, changes of uh, bringing China on board, but definitely is one of the partners we, sh we should look after. The U.S., of course, is a, is a big partner um, uh, with Joe Biden. It's possible, but uh, remember, there's still a lot of coal there and still a lot of uh, energy consumption per inhabitant, so it's difficult. And then there are a bunch of other big countries we, we have to bring on board, and that's not going to be easy if you think about Brazil or, uh, or Russia and countries like that. Do you, would it be right to say you, your view is that there should be a small, strong coalition of the major pollution, polluters and then try to bring everybody on board from there? Well, I think that's part of the, of the thing is that you bring some people around a project, some countries around a project, and then you uh, create a board of tax adjustment. It's not a great thing. We all agree on that. But, you know, it puts pressure and it levels the playing field. And then, uh, you know, you try to spread, uh, to spread the thing, you know, and, and who knows? We have a few questions here about the different, uh, who uh, 
what's the role that different institutions, different bodies, different parties have to play? For example, central banks. We have a question about the role that central banks have to pay. This is a question coming in from somebody who's at the New York, uh, the NY Fed. How about central banks? Maybe uh, I could intervene here. Um, when first, I'm not completely agree in, uh, in aligned with the, with Claude's uh, position on nuclear. I think nuclear is part of the solution, and, and existing nuclear power plant uh, and the low cost uh, per kilowatt hour, so the, this uh, levelized cost of electricity. But you know, when you look at the uh, the progress, the technical technological progress in solar and wind. Uh, technologies uh, in the future, there will be a share available for, uh, in the electricity mix for uh, a relatively large one uh, for uh, for uh, renewable energy. I mean, uh, not only, in, and I don't know whether you can declare as a renewable energy or not. Uh, so, concerning uh, the role of central banks. Uh, well, it's, I mean, of course, we need, as I said earlier, we, we need everybody on board and, and central banks have their, have their role to play there. But we need to keep in mind that central banks have much less power than, than uh, executive governments, states. States can impose uh, ban, they can impose, uh, sub they can offer subsidies, they can, they can uh, impose a, 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 a carbon price. Uh, it's much harder for uh, a central bank to do to something like that. And, when, and not only central bank, banks and financial intermediaries could help, but uh, for example, the solution to divest uh, from the coal industry. Uh, we have seen that it's not necessarily uh, very efficient. I mean, when you divest from, from uh, the coal industry, uh, another two investors come to replace you. Uh, and keep in mind, I mean, tobacco industry, the tobacco industry uh, has not been weakened by, uh, by the divestment movement. It's rather uh, the high uh, tax on tobacco that has been imposed in the Western world that, re that reduce consumption and eventually uh, impose a, a control on, on, on the problem. It's not, it's not the financial sector that did that. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, um, you mentioned states. Um, perhaps we can talk a little bit about France, because obviously we're here today from a, um, a whole range of different places across the world, but quite a lot of us are in France, um, naturally, given that we're from the Toulouse School of Economics in the south of France. Uh, what um, Christian and Jean, you're both heavily involved. Um, you're actually chairing and chairing the climate subcommittee of an economic commission for France's president Macron on economic solutions for the post-COVID era. Um, how about France? Is, is France holding the Paris Agreement? Is France planning strong action? How does the French position seem to be today on the international scene? Uh, I could intervene, but maybe Jean, Jean want to say something on that. No, okay. So, well, first thing, I mean, Europe is a is a good uh, is a good student here. I mean, he, over the last twenty years, basically, Europe has been able to fulfill uh, its common uh, commitment. Uh, we reduce uh, emissions in Europe by something like 20, 20 25 percent uh, compared to the to the nineteen ninety. Uh, so, so we, we did something very positive uh, uh, compared to many other uh, international players. Uh, that's 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 not too bad. In France, with with its nuclear electricity, is one of the best uh, 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 the best countries in that dimension. Uh, that's first first point. Of course, carbon pricing is something important for France as everywhere else. But we know that we, that will not be enough. And uh, as you, everybody knows, we have uh, many other possibilities that come on pricing. W one important point, uh, as I tried to express in my five minutes earlier this afternoon, th there, is, there, there are a lot of actions that are possible that are not very efficient but in terms of cost per ton of CO2 saved. Uh, Claude talk about uh, hydrogen. Currently, hydrogen is not a good solution. It could be a good solution. In, in 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, and, and there are other solutions. Many of them have been submitted by the Convention Citoyenne for the Climat. Uh, those 150 uh, proposals, some of, some of them are excellent. Some others uh, did not necessarily pass the test of a positive, uh, positive uh, cost-benefit analysis. 
Uh, but that needs to be done. I mean, we should decide uh, what's the carbon value, uh, what's the benefit of those actions in terms of emissions of CO2. That requires valuing carbon and compare that to the cost and to see whether the balance is positive or negative in terms of cost and benefit. That will need to be done. Many of those actions are very useful. Let me just mention the example of... Uh, of uh, you know uh, uh, ban banning of us, the, the plan to ban uh, thermic engine by the year 2040, which is currently in the in the French law, and probably the carbon. I hope that the carbon price will be large enough uh, uh, earlier than 2040 to eliminate uh, uh, th thermic engine on our roads before 2040. Okay, thank you. Let's hope so. Um, Claude, can we come back to you for, um, to zoom slightly back in uh, again into one question that's been coming up quite a lot in the questions that have been coming in um, about transport. Um, electric cars, are they the solution? We, we think perhaps not. Should we? Um, what could be the green solutions for transport? We've made errors in that field. How do you feel? Um, where are we at with research and development in that field today? Is there merit in committing to just one clean vehicle technology uh, to, to enhance network effects and to accelerate uptake? Could you perhaps talk to us about any technological advances that seem promising? Well, for all those who, who have already worked on network economics uh, know how hard it is to, to give predictions on the equilibrium with uh, network externalities. Um, uh, more generally, uh, in most economic problems, the, the multiplicity of constraints and objectives uh, result in uh, so-called internal solutions. Uh, what uh, in the energy lingo we named the technology mix the, to manage the climate crisis, we, we need uh, everything, renewable and nuclear production, demand response and flexible plants, storage and interconnection and so on. There is not one single solution. And uh, for transport, the key is really, I think, autonomy. Uh, without a carbon tax, it will be hard to, be, to do better than gasoline, at least uh, in the short run. Uh, liquid hydrogen is difficult to store in passenger cars. Uh, compared to uh, gasoline, uh, you, you need uh, much more, much heavier and much uh, larger tanks uh, on board cars. So uh, it is uh, not just uh, from one to two, it's uh, one to ten, okay, almost. And uh, in the future, uh, if gasoline is banned from towns, as some uh, municipalities uh, commit to do. Uh, the outcome of the battle uh, between uh, electrical cars and uh, electrical motors and fuel cells uh, will depend on, on the network, on the density of loading and uh, fueling uh, stations uh, and the filling speed also. So I will not uh, do a bet on which will be the winner or will they win both. Okay. Risky bet. <laughs> um, Jean Tirol, perhaps we could talk a little bit. We've had quite a lot of comments or questions in about the notion of growth. And this is one of the elements we put on our initial slide. Um, can we realistically keep on growing as, as we are? Do we need to reduce our energy consumption? Well, I don't think we have to stop growing, to be honest, and I don't think it's even feasible or politically. I mean, if you think about the yellow jackets in France, uh, the effort which was required was very small and the purchasing power issue was, was huge. So if you think about the rest of the world and they all want to grow and that's legitimate. So I think it's, it's really not an issue about growing or, or stopping to grow because that's not acceptable for most of the world. Uh, the issue is one of uh, having the right institutions. We talk about carbon pricing, which is the obvious thing for an economist. But I want to emphasize R&D very much because we are late in the game. Um, and you know, if we don't do R&D, we are not going to succeed. And to do R&D, um, carbon price will help, of course, because you know, you can, uh, the royalties you get on your green innovations actually 
come from the carbon price because if it's cheap to pollute, then you are not going to be willing to pay much for, for, for innovations, so for, for, for licenses to innovations. Uh, we, are, we are going to need breakthrough innovation. So that's the kind of thing that I think is very important. So that's why I was mentioning an ARPA e uh, framework for Europe. We need something for the longer run. That's where the biggest market failure is. And as long as we don't have that, we are not going to succeed with all those net zero targets that we have assigned ourselves, which would be a real pity. So we need, we need actually to, to make progress. And, and like Claude, I will not make any bet on anything. And that's actually part of the thing, which is that we just don't know what is going to succeed. Uh, we need to have something which is peer reviewed, which has a, a chance to succeed. And then we have to take bets and we have to accept to fail. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a few more minutes left. Um, just a quick comment to uh, Marcel Boyer, just to say um, Marcel is one of the members of our TSC community who would like to ask a question. It's just that I had a, we had a technical issue with the chat and your question hasn't come through to me. So if you'd like to put it again in the comments, that would be really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, in the meantime, what I thought I might ask, um, I'd like ask the three of you to do as we close it. We're going to have a, a short um, talk from our students today. Um, which is very interesting. And I was, I was quite keen for us to take as many questions as we could from students. We have a lot of students following us today. So if you just give me three seconds, um, uh, anybody, whoever might feel like replying, question from a student, how do we measure a country's uh, greenhouse gas emissions according to its companies, even if they're not located in the same country or according to its territory? Well, uh, Jenny, I think it's more about the question of do we need to tax or value carbon on the basis of consumption or production? The difference between the two is uh, export and imports. Uh, it's true that Europe has been quite good, as I said earlier, in terms of reducing emissions on its territory, but it's, it has been at the cost of a deindustrialization and a transfer of the most emitting uh, activities to other parts of the world. Um, I, um, it, it's a difficult question. I mean, um, and, and currently the debate in Europe, in particular on the EU Green Deal, is about trans transforming the system, the EU ETS system, from a, a, a production-based system where we tax emissions where they take place, not where the goods generating those uh, those emissions are, are, are consumed. Uh, and, and currently we are sh shifting toward uh, production, from production to consumption. And I think we should do both. I think if uh, Europe wants to really play some, uh, a big role in the world, it should at the same time impose the carbon pricing to all production within the continent, not only those consumed uh, on the continent, but also the, the goods that will be exported uh, somewhere else. And on top of that, we should also tax uh, uh, emissions generated by product imported to Europe. So it would be the sum of the production and consumption in Europe. Okay, thank you. Um, just one last question. I found your question, Marcel. Um, so we're going to change uh, continent and skip across to Canada. Marcel would like to talk about the Canadian government who has just announced a path for a generalized carbon tax which will reach uh, 170 uh, Canadian dollars per tonne in 2030 with the early increase. The proceeds of this tax will be redistributed so it is revenue neutral. Do you think this is adequate? Well, it's not enough, but it's already something. Uh, probably, I mean, uh, in Europe, the, the idea is to, is to have a carbon price around 200 euros per ton of CO2 by the year 2030. It's much more than the 170 Canadian dollars by that time. Uh, so, so but, but what is good is that that's a clear commitment. Uh, I don't know whether it will uh, pass the test of, uh, of the control of the, of the province and the state, but at least uh, if it succeeds, it, it would be, I believe, the first country in the world that will uh, impose uh, not only a quantity, but a price on carbon uh, in 10 years from now. And, and with a clear message for all producers and emitters in Canada, that if they, don't, if they want to maintain emissions, 
they will have to pay the cost. And that's something good. And we don't have that in Europe. We have a quantity target and that imply a very large uncertainty borne by the entrepreneur about what will be the cost of emitting CO2 in 10 years from now. And I like the Canadian solution of having a clear price objective. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the times on question and answers. We have just a few more things on the program for today. Um, right now, we'd like to give the floor to some of our TSC students, students here at Toulouse School of Economics, who have um, received a grant uh, for their carbon footprint calculator for all. Um, we'd just like to give a few minutes to the students to talk us through their, their project. If you're there, I think we should have William talking to us about the project. Yeah, I'm there, thanks. Hi. Um, so I'm just going to share a small presentation. Oh. So th does it work? Yes, Sorry. it does. Okay. So um, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for uh, receiving the, the financial aid uh, from the alumni community because uh, without uh, this, uh, this, uh, this financing, we couldn't have done uh, this, uh, this project. So uh, I'm here to present it with, uh, with Raime, uh, which is uh, in, the, in the public, I think. Um, but we uh, also would like to thank all the members of the, um, of the team. So there is also Tiffen, uh, Vincent, and uh, Anaïs. So um, first of all, uh, as Christian uh, Gaulier said, just said, uh, we think it's very important to take into account uh, the carbon footprint of, uh, of countries because uh, in a globalized economy, it's uh, necessary to, uh, to account for uh, the, the emissions from the goods that are uh, produced uh, domestically, but also the goods that are, uh, and services that are uh, imported uh, and consumed uh, in the country. Um, so just to give you an example, in 2016 in, in France, the uh, carbon footprint of, um, of a French uh, person was around 11 uh, ton per, per CO2. Uh, while the um, Paris Agreement compatible tra trajectory, which uh, aims at limiting global warming to uh, two uh, Celsius degrees by um, 2100, uh, would need to divide uh, this, uh, this figure by uh, four uh, to uh, reach around two tons of uh, CO2 per, per inhabitant. Um, so uh, this, is, um, this is very important that uh, everyone could be aware of the uh, carbon footprint. Um, that's why we want to bring, uh, by creating a carbon footprint calculator, awareness to all uh, individuals, public and private actors about uh, this, this fact. Um, and um, we think that uh, allowing people to know about their carbon footprint could um, incentivize them to uh, and encourage them to um, take uh, concrete action to uh, modify the uh, consumption patterns and to reduce this uh, carbon footprint. Uh, that's why we want to create um, a free and, uh, and available uh, to all uh, carbon footprint calculator. So the idea of creating this uh, calculator emerged um, when we noticed that um, the existing calculators uh, for uh, individuals are uh, very fragmented meaning that uh, some uh, calculators are only uh, looking at specific, um, specific uh, emissions, for example, uh, air travel emissions, but I'll come back to, to that later. And um, many uh, of the calculators do not provide for, uh, for detailed methodology, uh, so we don't know actually where does the uh, data come from and uh, whether it's robust or not. Um, and uh, when we uh, looked at the offer for the, um, for the businesses, especially the small businesses and the local authorities, uh, we um, identified that uh, most of the, uh, the calculators are uh, actually um, too expensive for them, uh, even though they would like to uh, know their, their carbon footprint uh, to take, uh, as I just said before, concrete action to, to reduce it. Um, so just to give you uh, an example of all the, the calculators we, we've been through, uh, just to take some, some examples. For example, the, the, the one of WWF is uh, only specific to Switzerland, uh, which has a very different um, energy uh, system uh, than France. So of course, uh, the, um, the, the emissions uh, of uh, housing, for example, would be uh, very different. 
Um, D1 of the uh, DGAC only provides um, a methodology to estimate uh, air travel emissions. Uh, D1 of uh, the Fondation Good Planet uh, is quite comprehensive, but does not provide uh, for the, the methodology it, it uses. Um, and uh, for, for to provide you for, with the last example, the one of the uh, ADEM, which was launched um, a few a few weeks ago, uh, is still uh, very uh, very light and too simplified for us. And um, our goal is uh, really to provide a comprehensive tool uh, that uh, could uh, either um, ask you uh, just a few questions and uh, be a, a broad estimate of your carbon footprint or uh, you could uh, either uh, dive into uh, the specific aspects of your uh, of your carbon footprint uh, with uh, much more uh, detailed questions so um, in terms of the the timeline timeline and the next steps of our project so we are a bit late um, due to, to the to the to the situation, the, the crisis situation, and because we all um, we were all uh, students of the TSC last year, so we we now have a job, and so that's um, that's a bit uh, more uh, tricky to combine this project with our job. But we are working hard on it. So for now, we established um, the methodology for accounting uh, for the carbon footprint of uh, individuals. So it relies uh, mostly on the uh, on two uh, databases from the ADEM, which is the the, the, the uh, state agency for um, ecological transition, uh, which are the, the Bas Carbon and the Acribalis. Um, and just to give you uh, some 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 clues, um, it includes uh, bricks on uh, food consumption, transportation, housing, uh, leisure activities and habits, and also uh, waste um, waste behavior. Um, and uh, we uh, want this calculator to be updated uh, very uh, regularly because the, the, the databases uh, are, uh, um, are updated very regularly. So we want it to be uh, up to date and to include the latest uh, methodical advances. Um, so we are currently developing uh, the website which will host the uh, carbon footprint calculator. So I'm afraid we will have to wait a bit more. Uh, we think we're going to launch it in, in the first semester uh, 2021, maybe uh, maybe uh, in, in a few months. Um, and uh, so this, uh, this website will contain all the, um, the questions to assess your carbon footprint, but also all the uh, detailed methodology and of course, uh, we would be very keen on uh, exchanges with uh, with users on the methodology, and we uh, we will uh, update it regularly so as to uh, simplify the access to to, to the website and uh, to uh, the, the results. And um, we are also in the uh, initial uh, phase of uh, developing a methodology uh, to assess the carbon footprint of uh, small uh, businesses and local authorities. Um, and uh, so this is a, a much more comprehensive work uh, because it includes more uh, dimensions than uh, only for individuals. So this will uh, come uh, a bit later in, in the year. Uh, so thank you again for the, for the financing. Um, it helped us a lot um, to, uh, uh, especially to implement uh, the, the, and to create the, the website and to host it. So, so thanks a lot because uh, without uh, this uh, this uh, this app, he, we couldn't have done it. So uh, now I let the floor to to some questions. Okay, thank you, um, William. We don't uh, thank you very much. Congratulations for for your project to you and obviously on behalf of the whole team. Um, we whoops, my Zoom just disappeared. I think we're still here. Um, we have had, if you, what we'll do is we'll keep a hold of them for you in case you haven't seen them. Um, we have some questions come in and some, I think some comments for you, some interesting points, for example, from Eric uh, Chane, who's a, a close, uh, close to TSC, who's given you some advice about some data and his sources of data. So we'll keep hold of that conversation for you in case, in case that can be of use. Um, and um, unfortunately, we don't have much time now to carry on with that in terms of live questions. We're also being a bit careful about live questions today, given how we started our session, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to pass the floor now to our outreach manager here at TSC, uh, Jean-Baptiste, who is just going to speak to us very quickly about um, finding out more about today's topic. Jean-Baptiste. Hello. Can everyone see me? 
Answer myself. I can. Perfect. Fantastic. Okay. So yeah, we, we wanted to um, tell you about the new TSC magazine that is coming out tonight. Uh, we, we, you will find in it um, more on what uh, all free speakers uh, talked about. Uh, and you will also find uh, an exclusive interview with uh, Google's chief economist, Al Varian, um, with Maktar Diop, the um, World Bank uh, vice president. Uh, as well as uh, the latest news and events from, from TSE and other uh, point of view on, on climate and the fight on global warming. So I invite you to uh, go and read it. Uh, you can Google TSE Mag online or go on our website uh, tse-fr.eu uh, slash tse-mag and, and uh, you, will, uh, you will be able to read it. Uh, we will also put the link in the, in the chat. And it's available both in French and English. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jean Baptiste. Thank you. Yeah, you'll find the articles um, indeed by our speakers today and also this other uh, TSC faculty that couldn't be with us. Uh, we'll make sure we'll send the link to you, even if it has gone through the chat um, in the post event um, email.